We're in the book of Amos, and the title is Fat Cows, because I think if Amos was here, he'd call us all fat cows. You'll see why a bit later. Um, So keep on listening, you'll find out why. The topic we're looking at today is social injustice, seeing what God thinks about it and how we should respond. And there's been a lot of misunderstanding on this topic. There's a lot of misunderstanding. And I think the book of Amos can give us some guidance on this. In fact, more than guidance, I think he can give us correction, which is part of what scripture is about. You know, in Timothy, it says that, you know. So if you came here today thinking, I need a, a great boost to help me through my week, That's not how the Bible is designed to be all the time. Sometimes it does that, but sometimes it provides us with correction that we need. And as a result of repenting and living our life the right way, God does then bless you. So it's really important we hear this message today from Amos. Um, We need to hear God's voice today because we're fat cows. We're in a bad place. We need to repent, get on track. So turn with me to the first chapter of Amos. He's one of the minor prophets, so he's right near the end of the Old Testament. And if you have to, just go to the index in your Bible, look up Amos, and you'll find it. See a show of hands. Who's read Amos in the last month? Yeah. Okay. That's why it's good we're going to go into it. See a message that is often not talked about or is talked about in the wrong way. The start of the book of Amos, right? Chapter 1, you get a long list of judgments that are proclaimed against Israel's neighbors. These are pagan nations, people who don't have a relationship with God, right? In verse three, look at chapter one, verse three. He starts off with a judgment against Damascus. Then look at verse six. He makes judgment against Gaza. Verse nine, Tyre. Verse 11, Edom verse 13, the Ammonites, and then chapter 2, verse 1, Moab, the Moabites. Now, these are all pagan nations. Yeah, they don't follow God, and God's proclaiming judgments against them, right? And Amos, the prophet, is speaking out these judgments. Now, at this point, all the Israelites would be nodding their head and going, yeah, they're bad people. They're bad people. They're wrong. They do terrible things to people. They're unjust people. They should be punished. They're all nodding their head. Just like we do when we hear about bad things world leaders do. And we say, that guy is a bad man. He's done bad things. And we we think, yeah, he's going to answer to God one day for that. And we do that. We look at other people who don't have a relationship with God, and we think they are bad. We disagree with slavery, with genocide, with human-imposed poverty. We know God hates it, and we know God will judge people for it. But now, these list of judgments in Amos, now they turn to God's people. If you look at verse 4, he addresses Judah. Now, after King Solomon's death, Judah and the rest of Israel were split. Right? So it's like you've got two different countries going on. Before you had one, now you've got like two different countries. So the Israelites, who were the northern tribes, they would now hear about judgments against Judah, and they'd probably still be nodding their head thinking, yep, we don't like Judah, don't like them. But then in verse 6, he now addresses Israel. That's what we're going to focus on today. Amos 2, verse 6. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not revoke the punishment. Because they sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. Those who trample the head of the poor into the dust of the earth and turn aside the way of the afflicted, A man and his father go into the same girl so that my holy name is profaned. Now, this would have been a shock to the Israelites. They've heard the list of judgments for all the pagans and they're nodding their head going, yeah, destroy them, God. And then God says, you lot are wrong too. I'm judging you. Been a total shock for them. He's telling them they have a problem. They're going to be punished. The point I want to make at this stage, this is just the introduction is that rather than focusing on how bad the world is, we as Christians need to focus on ourselves. Don't judge the world, judge yourself. When I say yourself, I mean the church. The church is not supposed to be judging the world, but the church is supposed to 
judge itself. Check it out, right? Um, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5.12, For what have I to do with judging outsiders? In other words, me as a believer, what have I got to do with judging non-Christians? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? He's saying we've got to keep the church pure. There's sin inside the church. We've got to deal with it. And, and then we've got um, Romans 2.3. Do not suppose, O oh man, that you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God. So in other words, when Christians look at General Mugabe and says he's an unjust man, he doesn't care for oppressed people. The question is, do I care for oppressed people? Because I've just judged Mugabe on that. What about me? I've just judged Tony Blair on this, George Bush on that, Saddam Hussein on this. What about me? As Christians, we need to do that. We need to ask ourselves as a church, what about us? Let's not blame the world, let's look at ourselves. So forget today about how other people do injustice. World leaders, local loan sharks, businessmen, we're not looking at them ripping people off. We're looking at our own concern for the things that God cares about. Now, with that in mind, let's get back to this judgment, right, that God proclaims. There's two things mentioned in this judgment in Amos 2, 6 to 8 here. The two things going on are firstly, social injustice. Yeah, people are treated unfairly. The poor people are really poor and they have no legal rights. Okay, and the second thing that's going on is idolatry, which is where people don't treat God as number one, and instead they bring other things and they put before God. In this case, you've got, you know, a man and his father go into the same girl so that God's holy name is proclaimed. So God's people, a man and his son, are sleeping with the same girl. That's idolatry, putting sex before God. And today we have many subtle ways of doing idolatry. Many things we put before God. You know, it could be fishing, could be football, could be TV, could be shopping, whatever. There's, there's many things we can do, right? If God ain't the number one, then the other things that are taking his place are idols. So these are the two things mentioned here, social injustice and idolatry, and they bring about God's judgment. So both of them are really important, right? Both of them are really important. Both are themes that go on throughout the book of Amos. Okay? I'm not going to argue today that Amos is only about social injustice, but I also can't say it's only about idolatry. The two of them go hand in hand. And that's important because often people separate them. Right? And I've got to give you a real quick history lesson so you understand how this has happened. Right? About a hundred years ago, some guys came out with a phrase, social gospel. Right? Social gospel. It's an unfortunate name because Paul says there's only one gospel. If anyone preaches a different gospel, let them be condemned, right? But these guys came up with this term social gospel and it was linked to evolution and it was linked to socialism. And what they said was they were basically liberal Christians, okay, who don't believe in the things we would believe in, like the resurrection, crucial stuff like that. And they said, let's help people. Help them practically, give starving people food, starving Africans food, so they don't die. But we don't need to tell them the gospel. We give them the social gospel, okay? These guys were very concerned with social injustice, which is one of the themes in Amos. But the theme they weren't concerned with was idolatry. They didn't care if there were people that didn't have a relationship with God and that didn't worship God. They put social justice in front of idolatry which meant you can feed an African child so he doesn't die when he's a child, but he grows into a man who hates God and dies an idolater and goes to hell. Not a good system. So then in response to these guys, right, you had what's called the fundamentalists. And the fundamentalists reacted strongly to the social gospel guys, right? And they emphasized personal salvation. They emphasized the fact you need to have a relationship with Jesus, but because of the social gospel guys, they then ignored social injustice. And they were like, we don't, want, we don't want to do this stuff with helping poor people and feeding them. We just want to tell them the gospel. And what they did was took one theme from the book of Amos and threw out 
the other theme. And one of the reasons why was because they got, after World War II, they got really into prophecy, end time prophecy. And people are thinking, the world's going to end soon. So if the world's going to end, why bother building an orphanage for these orphans? Because the world's about to end. You know, and you hear people talk that way today. You hear Christians say, I don't care about that stuff because it's the end times anyway. It's funny because every generation in the last 2,000 years thought that they were right at the very end. So imagine if everyone took that attitude. We'd still have slavery now in England. We'd still have kids working in factories. All kinds of terrible things would be going on because the Christians wouldn't have done anything about them. They would have just said, oh, it's the end times. Um, Interesting as well because... You look in the prophets, and it's not just idolatry they're concerned about, it's social injustice. But these guys were studying prophecy and just focusing on, on idolatry and how Jesus is coming back. And they missed out all the stuff about injustice. So, I don't think either of these approaches is right. Social gospel approach or the fundamentalist approach. And I think the book of Amos helps us get some balance, okay? What I'm going to say, because... We're not going to talk about idolatry much today because we we talk about that quite a lot. It comes up a lot in our studies as we go through the Bible. So today we're not going to focus on idolatry. I'm going to take that as a given for you guys who are here week after week. But what I am going to say is that social justice is futile if you're an idolater. So there's no point in being involved in stamping out social injustice if you're an idolater. In other words, if you don't put Christ as number one in your life, there's no point. So just state that first. Don't think, oh, as long as I take care of poor people now, I get into heaven. Don't work like that. Now, with that in mind, let's go through Amos and see what he says about social justice. Amos 3, starting at verse 9, this is what he says. Proclaim to the strongholds in Ashdod and to the strongholds in the land of Egypt and say, assemble yourselves on the mountains of Samaria and see the great tumults within her and the oppressed in her midst. They do not know how to do right, declares the Lord. Those who store up violence and robbery in their strongholds. Now here, God is calling pagans from Ashdod. Does anyone know who lived in Ashdod? Philistines. So he's calling the Philistines. Now you know they're bad people, right? Yeah, Goliath was a Philistine, okay? Calls them, and then he calls people from Egypt who are called Egyptians. Yeah, so he's calling the Philistines and Egyptians. You know, they were bad people. Yeah, they used to kill Hebrew babies. Slavery, just ridiculous. These guys were masters of slavery. So he calls these two people and he says, come and see what's going on in Samaria, which is in Israel. So he's telling these people who are well known for oppressing people. Yeah, these are the guys. This would be like today, yeah, calling like, you know, North Korean government and the Burmese government, you know, who who have got a terrible record for civil rights and saying, come now and come to our church here and have a look what's going on so you would have thought that it would be saying come and see how my people work God's saying come and see my people look how wonderful they are compared to you that's what you would have thought would be going on here but it's not but that's what should be going on and the point I'm making is God's people are expected to demonstrate more justice than other people do we should be the flagship for demonstrate injustice you should be able to say to the philistines and egyptians come and see god's people see how they do things you should be able to say to general mugabe come and see the church see how they do things say to hitler come and see the church see how they do things should be able to say that we should be an example we're god's people today the church we're god's people so what you hear amos saying to the israelites You could equate that to the church today, living in the new covenant. People who have become Jesus' brothers through his death on the cross. We've turned to Jesus. He's forgiven us of our sins. We're his people. We live in a community. Now, we did used to be leading the way 
with social reform. I don't know if you guys know that, if you remember from history, but Christians in the past have been responsible for prison reform, for the prohibition of the slave trade, abolition of slavery. You know, the film Amazing Grace has just been out. It was a Christian who was behind that. Um, you got the factory acts. Factories were terrible, terrible places. Yeah, it's, it's disgusting when you hear what factories used to be like in England, okay? It used to have children working in factories under disgusting conditions, working ridiculously long hours, okay? And, and Christians fought for the protection of children and for the protection of, cruel, of animals, cruelty to animals. This is what Christians did. Christians had a big heart for justice because they got it from their God and they emulated their God. They were like God, be holy because I'm holy. So they acted like their God and they brought about great reforms. Now today, a lot of Bible believing Christians move away from these things because they're worried that they'll be seen as the social gospel. And they see what the social gospel guys do and they think we don't wanna be anything like that. And I've, I've read papers on this, right? From so-called scholars who are saying how we don't want anything to do with social justice. It's wrong. And I think, boy, if you was a little kid a hundred years ago in London, would you really be saying that? You know, if you had the black lung from working in the mines as a little boy, would you be saying that? If you was a black slave on a boat in a tiny little box squashed next to other black slaves with nowhere to put your human waste, would you really be saying Christians shouldn't be involved in this? It's too easy now in 2007 to say, oh, we don't worry about that because we're reaping the benefits of what Christians have done before us. So we are supposed to be the flagship for social justice. We should be, we should be a demonstration to the Philistines and the Egyptians that we're doing it the right way. Now, by the way, all those reforms I talked about were an outcome of the evangelical revival in the 18th century. That's where it all came from. It came from a revival. It came from people turning to Jesus in repentance. So, we're supposed to demonstrate justice, but where are we supposed to demonstrate justice? There's so many needs in the world. Where should our main concern be? If you look at verse 9 in Amos 3, he says, Assemble yourselves on the mountains of Samaria and see the great tumults within her and the oppressed in her midst. You see that? The oppressed in her midst, in the middle of the people in Samaria, there's oppression going on. NIV translates this as among her people. In other words, with the Samarians, Samaritans, with these people, there are oppressed people within their own people group. It's like saying to Hitler, this is what this verse is like saying. A message to Hitler saying, hey Hitler, you're all into the Aryan race, right? You want to big up the Aryan race but oppress all other peoples. Well, check it out. Come and see God's people. They're oppressing their own people. They're worse than you. That's kind of like what it's saying. It's a terrible indictment on God's people. Can you, you see the implications for the church today in the world? It'd be like saying, hey, look at the church in the world. They've got oppressed people in their midst. And they're oppressing them, and they don't care about them. That's what this message is like. We complain about world leaders not releasing the debts of other countries, right? And we blame it on Blair, that there's African nations in poverty. Yet at the same time, do we care about the 350,000 Christians in Iraq who fled their homes since 2003? 350,000 Iraqi Christians who fled their homes, forced out by Muslims. Nowhere to live, no land to live off, no money. Do we care about Sri Lankan Christian children who are not allowed to go to school because they live in Tamil Tiger territories? Their children are Christians, they're not allowed to go to school. What about Pakistani Christians who are, some of them are only allowed jobs such as being a street sweeper or cleaning the sewers and they get ill doing these jobs. Some of them, they end up, they need money so badly 
they end up being bonded laborers for their bosses. And they take loans out from their bosses that they can't really pay back, and they end up working like slaves for their bosses in Pakistan because they're Christians. Because the good jobs be given to Muslims. Christians can't have those good jobs. They're only fit for cleaning sewers. Or Chinese Christians who are frequently arrested, beaten, and tortured, and imprisoned. Or the 50, in between 50,000 and 70,000 Christians suffering in North Korean prison camps. North Korea is the top persecutor of Christians. And there's about 50 to 70,000 Christians in their prison camps. Check this out. People are always trying to escape North Korea. And what happens quite often is non-Christians escape North Korea, go into South Korea, become Christians. And you know what the first thing is they do? Escape back into North Korea, knowing they can get tortured, knowing they can have body parts cut off for their faith. But they want to tell the other North Koreans the gospel. These are oppressed people in our midst. Oppressed people in our midst. You won't hear about this stuff on the news. That's why I'm telling you about it today. Our primary concern should be for oppressed Christians. I'm not saying we shouldn't care for non-Christians. We really should. We really should. What I'm saying is that our primary concern should be for Christians. Your number one focus for the people in our midst, the people among our people, oppressed people among the church. I don't know if you know this, but when you give money to Sudan through a secular agency, it goes to Sudan. Okay, so the money comes from England, goes over to Sudan, right? And then in Sudan, it's distributed to local agencies who then distribute the money, okay? Now check this out. The local agencies are normally Muslim run. So what happens to the Christian families in Darfur? They don't get anything because they're Christian. When you send money to Sudan for a secular agency, you need to be aware that when it gets to the grassroots level, most of the time it's not gonna go to Christians. Now, I praise God that it goes to Muslims as well. They're starving Muslims, they need to be fed. But there's a time where Christians need to say, you know what, I'm gonna give money to a Christian organization that makes sure that when they get into Darfur, that they give the money to Christians. The same thing's going on in Lebanon. You've got Lebanese families, their houses have been bombed in the last few weeks, and the local aid agencies are Muslim. And money's coming over from England, but it's only being given to Muslims. Christians aren't getting anything. We have a duty to these people in our midst to, number one, be concerned about them. I'm not saying when there's a tsunami, don't say, oh, there's no Christians there, I won't send money. What I'm saying is that with your money, when you want to give, first place it goes to is to oppress Christians. Make sure it gets there. Now, the prophecy continues. He says... In verse 10, they do not know how to do right. It's talking about God's people. They don't know how to do right, declares the Lord, those who store up violence and robbery in their midst. So it says that they don't know how to do right. They don't know how to look after oppressed people. I feel that's like us. We don't know how to look after these people. We're not educated about this because so many Christians are afraid. We look like we're doing the social gospel. Oh, don't talk about social injustice. Let's preach Jesus. Yeah, we preach Jesus, but we still get loads of money each month and we can give it to our oppressed brothers and sisters. The evidence that these people are not doing right is they store up. They store up things for themselves. That's the evidence they don't know how to do right. Because instead of giving to the oppressed, they're storing up things. And look at the things they store up. They're called violence and robbery. Now, that doesn't mean they've got boxes of violence and boxes of robbery in their house. It means, I think, that God looks at the things they store up and he sees them as violence and robbery because they come about from violence and robbery. They've got this wealth because of violence and robbery. And there's two ways we can look at the implications for this today. First way is to say, us Christians in England, we don't really know how to do right. What we know how to do is store up things for ourselves, enjoying the wealth of being an English country that, let's face it, England's got a lot of wealth because of what it's done to other nations in the past. 
Okay? And even today, England has wealth, and that, you know, England's try, trying to get money from countries that are in debt to England that we know will never be able to pay off the debt. And England refuses to release the debt. And I'm not going to get into a discussion about whether that's right or wrong or anything about corrupt leaders that would just take the money or anything like that. All I know is that we enjoy a lot of wealth in England, and sometimes it's because we don't let other countries off the hook. Sometimes it's because we buy things from, we import things from countries at an unfair price. Tea, coffee, sugar, whatever. And sometimes it's because we want diamonds that Africans are killed for every day in Africa. So that someone can walk down the street with a big rock in their ear. And we need to be aware of this and this should affect the way that we shop. Being a Christian should affect how you shop. Don't get conned into thinking, oh, that's what the liberals do. <laughs> you know, that should be us as well. Should affect how we shop. Jesus wasn't walking around flossing. You know, he wasn't. He wasn't. Okay, now, you might want to consider fair trade. You might want to look into that. This is things for you guys to pray about. I'm not telling you guys a list of rules you will have to do. It's just stuff for you guys to pray about. But I want you to think deeper than this. I want you to think deeper than fair trade. There's a second way to look at this, right? Because remember, legalism can sometimes be finding where the line is and seeing how close you can get to that line and saying, as long as I get my fair trade tea bags, then there's other things I can do that are cool. And I don't want to encourage that in this church. I want us to have an attitude of mercy comes from the heart, comes from the love that Jesus has given us by dying for us, laying down his life for us. And then we, in turn, want to lay down our life for our friends. So another way to think is, when God looks at my wealth, what does he see? When he looks at my wealth, the things in my life, what does he see? The things I'm storing up, how am I able to store them up? Is it because of injustice in my own life? In other words, if I'm able to store up things like TVs, stereos, phones, jewelry, expensive holidays, is it because I'm not giving money to the oppressed people in my midst? Is it because I'm not giving money to suffering Christians in the world? Is that why I can buy the latest phone? Is that why I've got the latest trainers, the latest jeans? Is that the reason why? When God looks at my jeans, does he see violence and robbery? Something to pray about. When he looks at my wealth, does he see the faces of the Christians in Sudan that I haven't sent money to? When he sees the tickets for the latest holiday I want to go on, does he see the faces of Christians in Pakistan who can't afford to eat this week? Or when he sees the latest book I've bought, 10 Steps How to Be a Wonderful Christian, does he see the faces of Christians in China who don't have a Bible? I could have sent them a Bible. They don't have a Bible. I've got all my Christian books. You see, we're called as Christians to look after the body of Christ. That's how the system works in the church. Our brothers and sisters who are worse off than us, we're supposed to be helping them. If we don't help them, we're withholding justice that God intends us to give them. Check it out. Galatians 6 verse 10. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone. Now check it out. Everyone, okay? So non-Christians as well. Yes, yeah, tsunami, whatever. Give to everyone, okay? Do good for everyone. But it says, and especially to those who are of the household of the faith. So give to everyone. It's amazing how many people read this verse and just focus on the especially and say only give to Christians. It's nonsense. Absolute nonsense. Now, if you look at China and you see how many Christians there are now, like about 70 million, did you know back in the day, missionaries weren't just preaching the gospel. They were setting up schools and orphanages and universities. And, and now look at the fruit from that. So we do good to everyone helping your local youth club, helping your local charity shop, whatever. Do these things. We do good to everyone, but especially to believers. Now, another verse, James 2, 15. If a brother or sister, so someone in the family of Christ, right? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, 
And one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body. What good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works is dead. So we don't neglect social injustice. We say if we have faith, but aren't interested in social justice, our faith is as good as dead. Problem is, in England, as Christians, we often want to make our lives more comfortable all the time, improve our lifestyle. We've been brainwashed with this from day one, haven't we? You know, we don't have the American dream over here because that, that wouldn't work in England. People would be like, I'm not going to be conned like that. I don't know if you noticed, commercials, adverts in England are different to commercials in the States. If you've got Sky TV, you would notice that, right? Because the British mind works a different way to the American mind. But we've been conned in exactly the same way, but just in a more subtle way. We look at Americans and we say, oh, look at them with their American dream. They're so foolish. But we've been sold our own dream. We just weren't told it was a dream because if we were, we wouldn't have fallen for it. So, you know, we are all following the British dream, even though we didn't know there was a British dream, but we've all been sold it. We've all grown up seeing all the commercials and everything. You know, when I was a kid, all I cared about was Nike trainers. You know, everyone in my school had Nike trainers and I didn't. And I got my, I bought, I got plimp soles from the charity shop and I, I cut a little blue Nike swish on them and I glued it on with Pritt stick. <laughs> and I turned up because... I was definitely the poorest kid in my school. I don't think anyone would argue that. And I turned up, you know, thinking, yeah, I've got my Nike Airs on. Of course, everyone laughed at me. Fortunately, there was one boy. He was a wealthy kid, but, he, you know, he, he was a good guy because he, he said to me, he said, I've got an old pair of Nike Air. Do you want them? And he gave them to me so I didn't have to walk around with these ridiculous imitations. But as a kid, even though I used to see my mum praying, for food, she's not here now. So I can say, I used to see her on her knees saying, God, I need food. She'd be crying and she'd be praying for food. And there's me thinking, I want Nike Air trainers. All the other kids in my school have got them. Why haven't I got them? Which is why I, I do support school uniforms these days. Yeah. And, so, and so I was brainwashed thinking it's all about Nike Air. And uh, you've all been brainwashed in the same way. Where are you going for holiday this year? <laughs> you know, it's like as if there's this whole thing, you're supposed to go abroad. You have to go abroad on holiday, you know. You know, you know in, in uh, the Apostle Paul's day, he saw going abroad as preaching the gospel. <laughs> he didn't see it as getting a suntan at Ibiza. So, this was the same in Amos's day, yeah? In Amos's day, people wanted a comfortable life. Check it out. Amos 4, verse 1. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are on the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to their husbands, bring that we may drink. Now this is addressed to the wives in Samaria, right? The wives who are saying to their husbands, bring that we may drink. I think this means, give me stuff so that I can live a good life. This is what the women were saying to their husbands. Now, this is how we are in England today. Christians in England want a good life. This is our cry. Bring me stuff so that I can enjoy it. And how does Amos call them? He calls them, you cows of Bashan. Now check it out, right? These cows were well known for being well fed. You'll see this in other scriptures, yeah? These were cows that had a good diet, okay? So what he's saying is, he's saying, you fat cows. That's what Amos is saying to these people. You fat cows who say, give me, give me, give me, so that I can have a good lifestyle. That's why the message today is called Fat Cows. And like I said earlier, it was going to be called, are you a fat cow? But Shay thought that would be a bit too raw. But that's really the message. As I looked at Amos, I was like, I am a fat cow. We're already well fed, but we want more. Christians in England are fat cows. We are, even if we think we're poor. I grew up thinking I was so poor, you know, and in Roehampton Church School, I was. But compared to India, I was rich. And something we got to avoid in London is thinking of ourselves as working class and poor and realizing that we are rich. We're well fed, we got roofs that keep the rain off, we got jobs. We got a free health service. We got Bibles. In fact, we have a disproportionate amount of Bibles to the amount that we read the Bible. You know, you, you could have 10 Bibles in your house, so you don't read it enough. 
We have religious freedom, a disproportionate amount to what we actually use of our religious freedom. We don't go to prison for our faith and leave families behind. We don't get martyred and leave families behind. And we don't get chased out of our homes and have nowhere to live. We're very well off in this country with fat cows, but we keep wanting more. And there's oppressed people in our midst. But we say, bring that we may drink. So the question to ask yourself is, does your lifestyle hurt oppressed Christians? The way we live our lives, the way we spend our money and our time, does that hurt oppressed Christians? In other words, does our continued desire for more and more mean that we don't help our oppressed brothers and sisters and give them the charity that they should be getting? The way God set up the church, they should be getting it, but instead we say, no, I want this, this, and this. And so our brothers and sisters don't get it. Pray about this. Ask what God would have you do. Now at this stage, I'd expect a few responses in your, in your minds. One would be, I can't stand hearing people talk about social injustice. Another response could be, don't preach to me. I'm one of the good guys. I have a good relationship with God. I pray, read my Bible, go to church, worship, tithe. I'm cool. Another response will be, you know what? God blessed me with a comfortable lifestyle so that I could enjoy it. Another response will be, I just love shopping. Another response will be, why does he keep going on about Christians? Why does he care so much about looking after Christians? All these questions are going to be answered now. First, if you can't stand hearing people talk about social justice, check out Amos 5 verse 10. It says, they hate him who reproves in the gate and they abhor him who speaks the truth. Now check it out. The gate in those days was where court was held. So if you were to ever deal with a situation of injustice, legal rights, money, anything like that, it would be done at the gate. So this is saying that there's a person who reproves in the gate. There's a person who speaks up for justice in the court, who says, this is unjust. And it says they hate him. Sadly, a lot of Christians today dislike people who talk about social justice. It's because of this phobia that we're going to return to the social gospel where we don't preach salvation through Jesus' death on the cross. But we don't have to do that. We can talk about social justice and preach about Jesus' death on the cross. It's not a one or other thing. They should both be there. So the application here is don't hate on people who are into social justice, even if they're not Christians. Don't be like, oh, but that guy isn't a Christian. There may be a pop star who maybe isn't a Christian who's going around the world trying to get people fed in Africa. Don't hate him. Pray for his salvation. And then say, why aren't good evangelical Bible-believing Christians, who it's very clear that they're a Christian, why aren't they trying to get poverty stamped out in Africa. Why are they saying ridiculous things like, and I've said it myself because I heard someone else said it and said it, which is ridiculous, with the, uh, you know, s stop poverty, uh, make poverty history, and people would say, oh, you always have poverty because Jesus said you always have the poor. That is a total misapplication of what Jesus was saying there. He was not saying, do not endeavor to stop people being poor. He wasn't saying that at all. He might have been stating the fact that there will always be poor people, but that would be like if you get loads of ants in your house one day. You know, and like, ah, there's always going to be ants. <laughs> Just leave them. But, you know, that's ridiculous. Or mice, there'll always be mice. Just leave them. We don't say that. I had, a, I had a wasp nest outside my house yesterday. I didn't say, ah, there's always wasps. No, I killed them. It took about six hours to kill them, but I did it. I blocked up their nest in the end and listened to them buzz their way into oblivion. Because I got kids. I want to protect my kids from getting stung in the garden. So you don't say there will always be poor people. Let's not worry about it. You say, no, if I know about poor people and I'm about to buy the latest new phone, maybe I should think about giving my money to poor people. So another response is, hey, don't preach to me. I'm one of the good guys. I pray. I worship. I read the Bible. I tithe. I'm good. Well, look at another verse in Amos. Amos 5.21. God says, I hate. I despise your feasts and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. 
even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. To the melody of your harps, I will not listen. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. He's saying, don't sing songs to me on Sunday and make your offerings when you don't care about justice. I'm not listening. Because when you're in a covenant relationship with God, it should lead to social justice. A relationship with God should lead to social justice. It's not one or the other. You become a Christian, God changes your heart, you should care about people who are being treated badly. Now another response people can have is, God's blessed me with a comfortable lifestyle so I can enjoy it. People often quote Paul saying about how he was content with, uh, what's the exact verse? Content with little, can't remember the exact verse. You don't really get the impression that Paul was talking about sometimes he was absolutely loaded. You don't really see that anywhere in scripture. But you see that sometimes he had a roof over his head and he had a coat to keep him warm and other times he didn't. You know, it's not talking about being in the top whatever percent of the world's wealth that we are in today. But check it out, Amos 6, verse 4. Woe to those who live on beds of ivory and stretch themselves out on their couches and eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall, who sing idle songs to the sound of the harp and like David, invent for themselves instruments of music, who drink wine in bowls and anoint themselves with the finest oils, but are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. Paints a picture of someone who's living the lifestyle of a king. They got an expensive bed, they eat good meat. Now Douglas Stewart reckons that most Israelites only ate meat about three times a year when it was religious festivals. These guys, you got a picture of them eating meat like it's just normal. That ring a bell for anyone? Myself included. They have plenty of time to lie around listening to music and singing. Uh, they drink a lot of wine. They use the very best oils, no cheap stuff, no Asda brand. And here's the kicker. Here's the kicker, right? But they don't care about the ruin of their people. That's the thing. They got these things they could argue, well, God gave me these things so I could enjoy them. Well, God says, but you're not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. I think that means you're not grieved over the ruin of your people, of your brothers. So I would say to anyone who says, well, I've been blessed with this lifestyle, I wouldn't necessarily debate that with them. But I'd say, are you grieved over the ruin of Joseph? Remember when Joseph, who here represents tribes of Israel, remember when Joseph, his brothers, put him in a pit? Remember that? Do you know what they did whilst he was in the pit? They munched on food. It says that in the Bible. Duncan translation, they munched on food. They were eating whilst he was in the pit. They didn't care about the ruin of Joseph in the pit. And we can do the same, busy eating. Meanwhile, our brothers and sisters are starving. So the application is, do we grieve over the church? I'm not saying that God didn't give you that job. God didn't give you that house, that money, whatever. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, with your wealth, at the same time, are you grieved over other brothers and sisters? Do you have a desire to help them? Young Christian girls in the world, are very often, this is, this is a tactic of Muslims in the world, kidnapped by Muslims, gang raped, and forced to marry a Muslim man. This is a tactic to turn, move people away from Christianity into Islam. This is how many women become Muslims in the world. Meanwhile, in our country, we've got everyone talking about the peaceful side of Islam, how we mustn't say anything rude about Muslims. I'm not saying we should say anything rude about them, but I'm saying we should care about our sisters who are having this happen to them in the world. We should care about that. We should be grieved over that. Being a Christian in many parts of the world means every day you live in fear of rape, torture, imprisonment, and death. In Sudan, little children are crucified. We should grieve over this. Consider that God may have blessed you 
so that you can bless your brothers and sisters. Now another response is, I just love shopping. I can't help it. Well, this might help you. Amos 8, 4. Hear this, you who trample on the needy and bring the poor of the land to an end, saying, when will the new moon be over that we may sell grain and the Sabbath that we may offer wheat for sale, that we may make the FF small and the shekel great and deal deceitfully with false balances, that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals and sell the chafe of the wheat. Now here you've got guys who want Sunday to be over. It wasn't Sunday then, but for us today it would be, I want Sunday to be over so I can go shopping. You know, and the Americans get a shock when they come over and they say, why do your shops shut at 5.30? How do I shop? You know, this is the mentality. We want to shop. We're trained to shop. What should we do now? Let's go to the shops. <laughs> Don't need anything? Let's go to the shops. Let's go to the shopping mall. This is how we've been brainwashed to grow up. And in this picture in Amos, you've got people selling stuff dishonestly. Just like if you go to sell something on eBay and decide to keep quiet about the fact there's something not quite right with the thing you want to sell. Oh, everyone does it. This is how we get brainwashed. That's injustice. We've got to be really careful how we shop as Christians. Really careful how we sell stuff. Selling, selling the chafe of the wheat, the chaff of the wheat. Selling that, you know, it's no good, but selling it as if it is good. We've got to be really careful about that, not being dishonest. Got to be really careful about desiring for Sunday to end so we can just shop and buy the things we want. Now, another response is, the final response people can have is, why do you keep talking about caring for Christians? What's the big deal? And this is huge. Turn to Matthew 25. As you're turning there, realize that Christians should desire justice for all people. But the Bible specifically warns that if you don't do justice, for Christians, there are eternal consequences. Eternal consequences. Matthew 25, verse 31. This is what Jesus says, talking about the end. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Verse 35, for I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. He's saying, what you did for my brothers, my people, the people who've turned from their sin and turned to me, those people who trust in me are my brothers. Remember Jesus' family come to see him one time? And he said, that's not really my family. My family is anyone who does the will of the Father. Okay, so whatever you do for one of Jesus' people, you do it for Jesus. Verse 41, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me, naked and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison and you did not visit me then they also will answer saying lord when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you then he will answer them saying truly i say to you as you did not do it to one of the least of these you did not do it to me 
And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So a true Christian, a true believer in Jesus, has had their heart changed by God. They have a new nature and they love Jesus. And they love Jesus' people. You can't love God and hate your brother. If you do, you're a liar. That's what John said. So we should have a love for our brothers and sisters in Christ. We should love homeless Christians in the world. Christians without money and food, without Bibles. Christians going to prison who just need a few people from the West to write letters, sign petitions to get them released. A true Christian does something about this. Maybe not until they hear a message from the book of Amos. Maybe when they thought they didn't have to worry about that. But once you hear this today, true Christian, you're going to act on this can send money to Barnabas Fund, Voice of the Martyrs. This isn't a talk to get money from me. We do give money from the church to these charities. Most of our money is spent on rent. But we do, when we've got spare, we give it to these charities. I don't take any money from the collection. I, don't, I get nothing. So this, don't think this is a talk to try and get money for the church. This is a talk so that you can live out your relationship with God, caring for your brothers and sisters in Christ. This is for them out there that they would get food, that they would get justice. Question for us is, are we too busy being fat cows? Now to sum this up, know that God is concerned with idolatry and he's concerned with social injustice. We all need to turn to Jesus. We all need Jesus to be number one in our life. We need to turn from our sin, turn to Jesus. We need to get rid of idols in our life and one of the idols can be living a lifestyle that's comfortable to us instead of picking up our cross and living that lifestyle. I think we all need to repent today. It can be a repenting for the first time saying, Jesus, I finally turn to you. It could be repenting saying, Jesus, I haven't cared for my brothers and sisters. I repent now. I want to care for my brothers and sisters. Forgive me. Either way, we all got to repent today. Secondly, Christians should demonstrate the standard for justice. We should be showing the rest of the world how to administer justice. We should be the flagship of justice. Don't let the next Prime Minister of England be the guy who demonstrates what justice is. Let's do it ourselves. If he does it as well, praise God, but let us do it. Do you know, do you know how the whole thing started with with the whole social system, the welfare state, it all started with the Roman Empire because one emperor saw how the Christians were looking after the poor and he got jealous because as the Roman emperor, you want to be the benefactor of the people. So he set up a system where they took care of the poor. It was all because of Christians doing it first. It's because of Christians that we have a NHS and job seekers allowance and all that stuff. It was because the government was jealous of the church. We can bring that back again. Our primary concern is for oppressed Christians. But at the same time, I don't want you guys walking away thinking we don't care for non-Christians. We should as well. We should as well. It's just if it's a choice between I've only got five pound, what do I do with it? I'd say give that to the Christians who aren't going to get any aid from the Muslim agencies at the grassroots level. That's what I'd say. I'd also say give it to the charities that are going to give them the gospel as well. Give them food and give them the gospel. If it's a choice between two charities, one doesn't give the gospel, I'll always go to the one that gives the gospel. But I don't want them to be a charity that says we only give the gospel and we see kids dying all around us and we don't give them food. That's just ridiculous. God has blessed us to bless others, not to store up. If you've got stuff that God's given you, then wonderful but consider that God might also want you to give to others. I don't understand why I was born in England. I read about Christians in Sudan, and it seems so unfair that I was born in England. And it just leads me to think, God must have put me here so I can bless others. And we should grieve the ruin of our brothers. It should upset us. I know today isn't one of those upbeat messages. This is the Bible, the way the Bible is sometimes. You know, there's a time for mourning, you know, and there's a time for saying, you know what, my brothers and sisters are worse off than me. And I'm going to focus on them right now. I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to give to them. 
We're united through these brothers and sisters through the cross of Christ. We're going to be with them for eternity in heaven. Now is a time we can bless them. We might not see their faces, but we can bless them and meet up with them in heaven and say, ah, you know what? We went through the book of Amos and we suddenly realized we needed to be with you guys. We started praying for you. And it's amazing when you read like the articles from Barnabas Fund in their magazine and you hear how thankful the Christians are. They get real simple stuff and they're so thankful for Christians in the world who send stuff to them. We can be a part of that. It's exciting being a part of that. We're living in a war. This is, we should have a wartime mentality the way we live our lives. Not stretching ourselves out on the ivory beds, chilling out. We should see it as a war. These are our persecuted brothers and sisters we can look out for. Let's pray. Jesus, your, your gospel is so convicting. It's so convicting to find out that we're selfish people who've been blessed so much but don't bless others enough. I'm sorry for that, God. I repent. We're sorry, God, for storing up things for ourselves. Thank you for your word that brings us correction. I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, God, we would change our lifestyles so that we are people who are concerned about the justice of our brethren that we would help our brothers and sisters around the world. Give us bigger hearts for them, Lord. Give us hearts as well, God, that don't just think for the Christians, but also want to help non-Christians in justice everywhere, Lord God. Help us to be like you. Pray that you would unbrainwash us, God. Renew our minds, Lord. Pray that you would speak to us about how much money to give to our brothers and sisters about how much time to spend praying for them. Lead us, God, so that when we do come to church, when we worship, when we study our Bibles, that is pleasing to you. Pray for our brothers and sisters in the world that you would help them, God. I pray there would be justice, that you'd wake up the Western church, that justice would flow from us like rivers, that we'd reach out to our brothers and sisters. Pray that you would help and strengthen our brothers and sisters and provide for them, Lord God. Amen.